I, I honestly, it's absurd how good these movies are. <laughs> it's like it, it's not logical. Yeah, yeah. I was yeah. like, no way, no way they, they well, can match you know, that. We put our heart and souls into these, man. Like it's a man. One one day, I hope someone does like the the proper behind the scenes where they just like start with us in the beginning uh-huh. <laughs> and actually watch what we go through and how much passion and how much you know how much goes into making one of these films. It's, it really is like a, a heavy lift for everyone involved. How long was the process from start to finish? I mean, years. I mean, I, I came on about uh, three years ago, I think. Like, okay. I, I've been working on this film since before Soul came out. Okay. So I started on Spider-Verse, I think, uh, two days after I wrapped production on Soul. So wow. that would have been mid-2020, even a little bit earlier. Yeah. Um, Justin was the production designer on the first film. So he just kind of like rolled into this. So they were still kind of trying to figure out what the movie was. And that's when I met Phil and Chris. Mm-hmm. And they were saying they were looking for another director. They kind of pitched me the idea. And I was really excited about it. And, um, you know, decided to come on board because I felt like I had a lot that I could contribute to the story that they were trying to tell with this film. Is it fair to say that, because so, I, I, you, you mentioned this, you were on this before before Soul was even out. Mm-hmm. But is it fair to say that in some ways Soul led you to this? Did they, did I would they look think at so. what you had done on Soul? As well, they of hadn't part? seen it. They hadn't, they seen, hadn't it. seen it. Yeah, yeah, nothing was out yet. It was yeah. just they heard about my work and my mm-hmm. voice. And, you know, like I, as I was getting ready to wrap up, I was kind of thinking about what I wanted to do next. And one of the things that, you know, came up was like, well, would you be interested in doing another animated film? <clears throat> and one of the first things I thought about was, the first Spider-Verse and just whatever Lord Miller were going to do next. Mm -hmm. So it was one of those, I didn't even know they were going to be doing a sequel, to be perfectly honest. I just was a big fan of um, the Lego movie. (laughs) And then this, um, and and I was like, wow, it seems like the Wild West over there. Whatever they're doing in Sony Animation is like the Wild West, because I actually saw the first Spider-Verse before that came out in theaters, because they brought it to Pixar. Okay. So I was sitting in the Steve Jobs Theater one day when it was like, oh, they were, they're going to show the screen this film during lunch, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. I was like, oh, let's go down and check it out. And I spent my lunch break watching it, and like I had to pick my jaw up off the floor. I was like, yeah. oh, my God, this was so not what I expected. And to be perfectly honest, some of the things that they did in that first film, because we were still in production on Soul, kind of, I think, opened up our minds to trying a few um, different things. Hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like like Soul has like needle drop music in it. Mm-hmm. And Pixar usually didn't have needle drop mm-hmm. music in it. And I was kind of like watching the first Spider-Verse. It was like, a, a needle drop can be used pretty damn elegantly. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, and you know, and that resulted in I think more of an openness to things like hearing a tribe call Quest in, mm-hmm. in Soul. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So So I think that one of the things, the misconceptions, I don't even know if it's a misconception, one of the things people don't understand about this world of feature animation is that we're all friends. Mm-hmm. Like, everyone knows each other. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a very, Hollywood is a small community, and then within that small community, there is this micro-community of people who, throughout their careers, do feature animation. Mm-hmm. Some people do animation, that's all they do, but then there's other people like, you know, Guillermo del Toro or Wes Anderson and stuff who kind of work in the medium sometimes. Right. But anyone who touches the feature animation medium, that's like a really, really small group. So mm. the attitude is supportive across the board. We all want to see great animation. And kind of sitting there watching the first Into the Spider-Verse while working on Soul, I knew I was watching something great. Mm. So I just kind of wanted to meet these dudes. And, oh, and when yeah. I did, I was like, they were like, yeah, you know we're doing another one, right? And I was like, really? And, <laughs> and so they, that's how it kind of came about that's pretty gracious of them that they brought this to the pixar campus like it like because you think you 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 from the outside it from the outside perspective you think oh man, these guys are competitors why would they take no that no to everyone pixar? shares it's, it's everyone shares you're saying yeah everyone yeah. brings in and, and pixar in particular yeah. like all kinds of movies come through mm-hmm. like you know i saw parasite at pixar like and bong joon ho came through like every filmmakers share yeah. their work mm-hmm. with other filmmakers yeah. and i think that's not just animation that's like across the board you know, yeah, I've seen that. rough cuts of films that don't come out till the end of the year because mm-hmm. as filmmakers, we love to share our work with other people who appreciate, who we think can appreciate the work and mm-hmm. can understand it and, you know, give us like thoughtful feedback. Mm-hmm. 
I love the needle drops. You mentioned yeah. shout out to Tribe Called Quest. Yes, indeed. Great, <laughs> You're wearing the group, shirt. <laughs> greatest group of all time. Yes. <laughs> no offense to the Beatles. Well, De La is my number one. Uh, I mean, of, of the yeah. native tongues, De La is my. It's top you know, rest, yeah. rest in rest, rest in peace, peace True Goy. Yeah, yep. man. Oh. Yeah, great needle drops. Yeah, I'm I am still mad at those guys for for Sunflower being stuck in my head for five years now. Yeah, it's a hell of an but, earworm. But I I think we got it, some pretty dope ear. earworms in this one too. I mean, yeah. I, I love the approach of um bringing in Metro Boomin, you mm -hmm. know, to, 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 to kind of like be executive producer and find all the artists, you know, mm -hmm. he, he loves to working with both. And because that's the best way to get the, the most current, like I'm a, I'm a certain age. Yeah. I don't know necessarily who's new and upcoming. Right. I just know the older stuff that I like. You well, know, there's a great Rakim Neil it, drop. Court, hello, exactly. Yeah, so like, <laughs> and there's a, there you know, so, and that's just it. But Metro, you know, has that connection to like, the music of the past, the music of the present, and I think the music of the future as well. I mean, one mm -hmm. of my favorite artists, uh, R&B artist, is James Blake. Mm -hmm. So I was so happy, and I knew, you know, Metro had that relationship with James Blake. So I was so happy that, um, like, on the song "Hummingbird," it's it's mm -hmm. Metro and 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 James Blake. But then there's lots of artists that he brought in that I'd never heard before, mm -hmm. um, but was really, you know, surprised by how much um, I enjoyed it. And I think that's one of the things that the first Spider Verse did so well. Is that like it was like, wow, this soundtrack is really opening as an old school hip hop head. Yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? It's opening sure. me up and giving me a great primer on yep. like the new voices in hip hop. Made me give in. Finally yes. made me give in to Post Malone. Yes. I resisted <laughs> I resisted for so long and then I couldn't with that earworm as you as you called it. Yeah, the whole SoundCloud, you know, yep. rap movement, yep. which I was very slow to pick up on at yep. that first soundtrack, you know, like really was like, wow, these yep. are the the heart the emotion <laughs> that a lot yep. of these um, young people brought into their their music, I really learned to appreciate it because of that. This one it feels more ambitious, obviously, like it any is. sort of sequel should. Yeah. I think that's like the rule. That's a rule. That's like rule number one of any yeah. sequel. I think. Like, what were what what did Lord and Miller say was sort of like your sort of top line goal here? Obviously, you're gonna you're literally expanding the Spider Verse in this right. one. But what what did they? How did they sort of present that to you in ter in terms of like the bigger picture goal? Well, the one? top line goal was actually really simple. It was an evolution of Miles and Gwen's story. Mm -hmm. So the 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 ambition came in like the story it, it was born of the story that we're trying to tell again the first film all these unique characters come to miles's universe this film it's him going to many other universes right. but that being said it's still a story about miles morales mm -hmm. and a story about gwen stacy and a period of time over like a year and a half has passed between the first and the second film and i think that as a parent who it's, it's so funny because i've been working on this film for so long um, my son is 19 years old now, so he just turned 19. He's in college, but when he was, when I started working on this, he was the same age as Miles Morales was supposed to be in the film. So it was very interesting yeah. as a parent to a teenager to kind of look at the coming of age, not just from the perspective of the kid's coming of age story, but the parent coming of age, going from having an adolescent to having basically a young adult. And I think that young adult in question wouldn't even consider himself a young adult. He'd consider himself an adult. Right. And both sides having to kind of evolve. Mm -hmm. So, and the other element of it was how different Miles was from so many other spider people. I mean, we think of Spider-Man and historically for a long time it was just Peter Parker. Mm -hmm. And there was this Candace idea of canon. You know, Peter Parker lives with his Aunt May and his Uncle Ben dies. And that turns him into Spider-Man. Well, Miles Morales has both parents. And as opposed to the secretive life of Peter Parker, you could argue that his parents are the people in the world who are closest to him, and he doesn't have a lot of secrets from them. They're a very close-knit family. Mm -hmm. So the rules, so to speak, of being Spider-Man, the rules that Peter Parker gave Miles when he first met him in the first film, those are kind of harder rules to maintain yeah. when your life is so dramatically different. So it really all started from this very, I don't want to say small, but very personal place very character driven place and then of course we get into our universe you know hopping hopping story but but yeah. that's kind of always been the north star let's talk about the animation style because yeah. man it, I, it is like i was in the front row just this is how i was watching this movie like, it, it's it's so it's so beautiful yeah. every every frame is like 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 a piece of art i swear to god oh man i can't wait it's so great like i'm thrilled for people to see it in theaters and I think this film requires like repeat viewing specifically because there are so many things in every frame yeah. that even us watching it 
again and again, and we've watched this film thousands of times in development, but watching it again and again, even we see different things that we didn't see. You, yeah. you know what I mean? That yeah, we yeah, forgot, yeah. oh, like, I forgot that was in there. I yeah. forgot that it does this. Like there's, there's one great moment that I always rewind and play again and again. Um, uh, when when Miles first comes to the 2099 world and, and Jess Drew makes a joke and there's all these spider people and she's like, anyone else got any jokes? And they all tell a quip. And we literally have 50 quips pop up right. in rapid succession. Yeah. And I kept going back and like reading every corny spider joke again and again and again. And and that's the thing, like this animation is born of comic book fans. Hmm. You know, like yeah. we, we all love, we all grew up loving comic books, you know, me, you know, Justin, uh, Joaquin, Phil, Chris, like we're, we're, we're of that generation. We're kind of like, we, we got our morals from comic books, you know, and, and particularly when it came to Spider-Man and a lot of the Marvel comics, they often represented very much the world of the, the 70s and 80s. You, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah. Like the X-Men were, were proxies for the idea of racial minorities. Mm -hmm. You know, Magneto versus Professor X mm -hmm. was, you know, Malcolm X versus MLK philosophically. Mm -hmm. And Peter Parker, the reason I think Spider-Man, whether it be Peter Parker or Miles or Gwen, the reason I think Spider-Man is, in my opinion, one of the most universally loved characters is that Spider-Man is like the everyday person <laughs> mm. who struggles with the challenges of the everyday person, mm -hmm. you know? So, I, I, I don't know, it just, it's a, we, we wanted that, that excitement of watching a comic, of reading your, a comic book. I remember the first time, like, I sat down and read, like, Frank Miller's Wolverine, or, like, saw Bill Sienkiewicz, you know, when, when you see these dynamically different styles, Todd McFarlane's run on Spider-Man, mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. these are iconic, these, these are, like, key moments in my ch childhood, in my young adulthood, and we wanted to bring that magic to this film. Like, when you jump into another world, it's like discovering that new artist for the first time. Yeah, there's uh, a little bit of MCU crossover. There's a mention of Doctor Strange. Sure, and, sure. And some, and some nerd from that world, yeah. uh, that, the live action Peter Parker. Uh, how would you sort of characterize how this movie exists in sort of like, in relation to the MCU? What sort of conversations did you have to have there? Well, we didn't have any conversations with Marvel, that's for sure. The yeah. conversations were just within our creative team. Okay. And it starts from this place of having fun. And I think fans are going to interpret it in any number of ways. And, and it's, I don't feel right saying there's a right or wrong way to really interpret it, you know. Uh, but, but, you know, we're, it's, this is a, a Lord Miller film. The, the whole idea of this creative process is about having fun and kind of being subversive and looking at the idea of comic books and comic book canon and comic book heroes and, and heroines and villains and where they are and all the rules and cause just kind of having a little bit fun with that. I know that seems a little bit vague, but it's it's just, it, again, there were no conversations in a, with our, within our team with anyone outside of the folks in our team. Okay. And the thing to understand is that like Miles Morales' universe, which is a multiversal universe, mm -hmm. there's so much to work with, you know? But we also exist in a world where the, that universe has always been very self-aware of the world watching that universe. That was the case in the first film as well. Mm -hmm. And I think we just try to continue that a bit. How would you describe sort of how you guys choose what there's, I don't even know, do you know how many different spider people and animals are I don't are have a hard one? number. Hundreds I, probably? Yes, I probably hundreds, say. yes. Over a hundred, I would say. What's the process of, choos of choosing those? Slow. I mean, we, <laughs> yeah. no, I mean, it. I mean, a lot of these, there's certain characters that just appear for a, a moment and don't have lines, but as you saw in the film, a lot of them have lines. Yeah. Like a lot of characters have pretty significant, pretty memorable moments, and those characters had to be conceptualized, created, designed, rigged, built, mm -hmm. <laughs> animated, rendered, lit, like a lot went into this. And there are shots where you see dozens of characters of different styles and each one had to be created with that style and then put into this world in which they're gonna be passing through which is not representative of the style that they're from. Mm -hmm. I mean, our our crew, there's a reason why we ended up having such a, needing such a massive crew on, on this film because bringing that all onto the screen was like a technical feat. And if you don't think it is, try doing it. Easy, yeah, <laughs> like yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it was really, really something. Yeah. Um, that's why I've been telling a lot of people like, if you can, when it comes out, get the art of book. Let's put it that way. Because uh -huh. so much of our conceptual designs, like early on, the, let's use it as an example, like the vulture. Mm -hmm. That character took us months 
I mean, we went through so many reference material. The reference material was everything from um, Leonardo da Vinci's paintings to like um, this this French puppeteer troupe um, called uh, something Deluxe. It was like a French puppeteer group where they created 30 and 40 foot tall marionettes. Mm -hmm. And we tried version after version of the, the vulture. Any character you see in here, trust me, yeah. there's been at least a dozen versions that have been rejected. And it was a, yeah. a process of like evolution. I mean, Spider-Man India, Pavitra. Great. That's a character that really, really evolved. Yeah. We brought in a, um, a cultural consultant from India mm -hmm. to speak about the meaning behind little elements of his, his costume. I mean, I think that more thought went into the appearance of Pavitra in this film than probably went into the character in the comic books, who was pretty much wearing you know, a Spider-Man costume with pants, <clears throat> and, no. and that's it. And the pants just symbolize the characters from India. Yeah. Our Pavitra... Everything has been considered, you know, down to his hair <laughs> and how he maintains that hair yeah. um, and, and the bangles and, the, and all the little little things on his costume um, and, and to the look of his world, which is based on Indian Andrew Jell comic books. Mm -hmm. So, like a lot. It's, it's, uh, even starting to talk about it, I get tired because it, it really did take a lot of people working a long time to, to build out a lot of these characters. How did you guys land on Donald? Uh, to bring back his Aaron is the live action Ken. Yeah, well, <laughs> I don't think it's speaking out of turn to say like there was a lot of um, excitement early on about the idea of someone from the live action movies making like a cameo, mm -hmm. and we we were working out the film and storyboards. And honestly, it was just like you animation's iterative; it's an iterative process. So you're working out in storyboards, and it's just what entertains us. So you know, we boarded versions where it was like. Andrew Garfield's there, and he's talking, and it was like, okay, that's that's kind of cute. That's okay. But then we boarded a version where they said the Prowler, and it was Donald Glover. Something about that just kind of like clicked in a very very funny way, um, and and of course one of the first things we wanted to do was like reach out and see if Donald was was down with it, and and thankfully he was. And it was it was we did that in one day. Uh, we set it up in New York like a studio. We had to build a costume, obviously a Prowler costume. Um, Chris flew out there. Chris Miller was there. Uh -huh. Me and Phil Lord were on the other side on the camera, and then we just worked it out over the course of a day, where we, um, you know, gave him some lines and and kind of explored a few different gags with Miles passing by. And I think it's great. I think it's like we, we love to like people to guess, 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 and then like to just be wrong and the surprise be equally as entertaining as what you think you're, you're going to run into. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, it just came from this fact of like, all right, if we're going to do a live action character showing up in this world, who should it be? And we tried a few different ones, and that was just the one that kind of made us all smile. I love it. Mm -hmm. What was the genesis uh, behind Issa's pregnant Spider-Woman? Well, um, Issa's character is like a, well, there was a pregnant Spider-Woman storyline in the comic books, mm -hmm. and that was always kind of intriguing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, oh, well, that's kind of cool. Like, the idea of Spider-Woman going through motherhood. Um, and also, this idea of a character who, Spider-Man is so much about secrecy um, and hiding their secret identity, but there was something really exciting about the idea of a Spider-Woman who doesn't have a secret identity who she is, she doesn't even wear a mask. She just has on glasses, everyone knows she's Spider-Woman, and it doesn't <laughs> matter. This idea yeah. of like a boss Spider-Woman who can serve as kind of like a mentor to Gwen, who was so confident and so confident in the first film, but mm -hmm. she's being cast into something uh, new. And with a lot of the characters that we created, um, we brought in a lot of the comic book artists who inspired the look of the characters to actually work in their creation. In the case of the Jessica Drew that Issa plays, Brian Stelfreeze, who is an amazing um, um, black comic artist, um, and, and not, not just for his comic books, he's also known for his some of his pinup work. Mm -hmm. And this idea of Jess Drew's design representing like a pinup style was really exciting. So we brought in Brian, um, and he worked really closely with our team, and we kind of you know refined it. Um, and came up with it, and, and I'm really happy with the end result. I think she's, like, really dope. Yeah. <laughs> I love her costume being more of, like, leather motorcycle gear. Yeah. Just the idea of a motorcycle that can, like, ride on walls, um, the way down to the way she shoots her webs. Like, again, the comic books are a jumping-off point, but we have our own world, mm -hmm. and at that, the jumping-off part, we the point, we then evolve from there. Mm -hmm. And so 
you know, she's our own unique thing that exists in our world. And I think she's our first pregnant superhero. Is she? I don't know. I, 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 I don't, don't know. know. <laughs> I, I, I have to fact check that too. Yeah, but yeah. I, can, I couldn't think of one. Yeah, um, I don't know. Well, at least noticeably pregnant, maybe. Yeah, I, I don't right. know. Yeah, <laughs> show it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kemp, this is great, man. It's so great. Oh, so my great, pleasure, so great dude. To talk to you. Yeah, really, always a pleasure.